Okay, Lucinda Coxon, you adapted The Danish Girl into a screenplay for the new movie. It took you a long time to uh, get the movie made. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it, uh, it did take a while. I, I, uh, I, I joined the project 11 years ago um, and uh, I, I, I wrote the first draft, I guess, 10 years ago. Um, we, had a, we had a pretty solid, when I say first draft, obviously I don't mean first draft, I mean first draft we were prepared to show people, which is, I don't know what draft that was, but anyway, the first version that we were willing to send out into the world was, was about 10 years ago, and um, everybody loved the script, people were very enthusiastic, but the subject matter was just considered controversial and uh, the mood was that nobody wanted to see a film that even if it were also a great period love story, nobody wanted to really see a film that was about uh, transgender. Um, and uh, we continued to be able to attach talent. We had a lot of great actors and directors attached to the project over the next kind of decade, but we still didn't manage to get it away. We came very close two or three times. Uh, um, but obviously now I'm able to feel very philosophical in retrospect. I didn't feel terribly philosophical, I can promise you, five years ago. But uh, but once once Tom Hooper came in, um, things really changed. You know, he's a he's a, he's an extraordinary director, and he brings a great deal of industry clout with him. In the wake of Les Misérables, Tom had actually read the script much earlier and had had been uh, very excited about it, but. Um, he was he was lined up to, to do Les, Les Miserables and having done Les Mis, which was a huge box office success, he, he just had enough power to, to take the Danish girl on as a passion project and to and to get it into production with, with a studio behind it. So that was a that was an absolute game changer for us. Mm -hmm. So talk about some of the uh, you know in adapting the book. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that you might have changed or taken out or, you know, just to make it a cinematic thing, you know, what, what was the adaptation process like? Well, this was slightly unusual as a, as a process because it had, uh, there wasn't just the, the novel. So the novel is based on a true story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a, one of the things that really excited me was this extraordinary historical story that had gone really unrecorded um, and so even the even when I was reading the novel the first time I was kind of researching alongside to figure out how much fictionalization had taken place and how you know what what liberties and uh, brilliant kind of developments that the novelist David Evershoff had brought to the table um, and what I discovered was that although there had been some very heavily there were some elements that were very that appeared to be very heavily fictionalized. So, for example, in the novel, Gerda Vena is Greta, and she is American. She isn't Danish. Um, she's she's an American from she's from Pasadena, and uh, she has a brother who's very heavily involved in the story. And there'd been a, so there was a that that was very different. But actually, once that was stripped out, the core of the story, the emotional who Gerda was emotionally was actually very true in the novel. So the, the fictionalization appeared to be very heavy, but was in some ways very superficial. Um, so I think my first instinct was to try and restore as much of the true story as I could, as much as we could find out, because researching that story wasn't straightforward. Um, it, it's a story that got lost for all kinds of reasons, partly because it's you know, women's history and queer history tends to get swept away. Mm -hmm. But also because of, you know, this is a, a story about a, a gender confirmation surgery that is performed in Dresden in 1930. And what happens in, in Dresden later in the 30s is pretty extraordinary and, and wipes away. For example, Lily's medical records were held in the women's hospital in Dresden. The women's hospital in Dresden was completely annihilated during Allied bombing in the Second World War. So it's not just Lily's records that don't exist anymore. That entire nothing existed in that city anymore. Um, and and in a sense, Lily's story was obliterated along with all, all that. So there was there was a job to be done with researching the true story. There is a memoir that's quite unreliable, but intriguing. 
um, that, that purports to be uh, a memoir by Lily Elba, but it's actually, it does contain some of her writings, some of her diaries, but it's but there are several other people writing in it, and there's quite an interesting set of agendas at work in it. It's not particularly, I mean, it's, it's illuminating in its way, but it's not particularly, not a very reliable factual document, I'd say. Um, so having kind of collated as much of that information as I, I could, I think my instinct with, with this was always that what really needed to happen for me was to really focus in on the marriage. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel very intimate. I felt that in order to go this journey with them and to really understand and feel the impact of this journey with them, you'd have to be very, very close to them under the skin of that relationship um, to the point where sometimes I think it almost feels claustrophobic. So I think it's a huge story that, that happens a lot of the time between two people in rooms. You know, it's in, it's in some ways a very tight focus on that couple. And I didn't really want to give an audience many places to escape to um, because the, nobody in that couple really has anywhere to escape to. Um, so I think that was, was really uh, a, a, a lot of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. There's also this brilliant challenge in writing the story that that you've got we have Gerda Vena who is um, a kind of model of unconditional love she's an incredibly good person and writing good characters can you know good characters can sometimes be tedious uh, you know we all want we all want to be good but nobody wants to be dull and um, and so I it was great to be able to write a character who is incredibly good and who is incredibly selfless mm -hmm. but who is absolutely not tedious her goodness is really active and radical and uh you know she's absolutely fascinating very front-footed sort of visionary individual and that's really um th that was really exciting for me mm -hmm. so that uh, along with um you know then having to tackle writing the einar lily arc which is you know terrifying in itself challenge there was was really to write write a role where at the beginning the audience meets Einar and Einar presents completely persuasively and simply as a man he, he's not a man with a lot of questions hanging over him he's a man he might be a little shy he's a little introverted perhaps not totally comfortable in his skin in some ways but we never think that he's anything but a man mm. um, and by the end of the film we are with Lily and she is a woman. And I think the, the great achievement of the film and of, of the work that Tom's done and of Eddie Redmayne's incredible performance is that you look back and you, and you feel it was always Lily. You can't really remember Einar anymore. There was only ever Lily. And I think that, so to, to achieve that arc, one has to write in enough silence. There has to be enough space around Einar for Lily to blossom, even when we're not in a scene where we're discussing her, where she doesn't appear to be present, there just needs to be enough space around Einar uh, 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 in those scenes for, for Lily to to just make herself felt, even if we're not conscious of it um, at, at the time. Right, yeah, and I mean, one of the extraordinary things about the movie are those moments of silence, um, you know, where you're just, seeing things uh, happen without a lot of dialogue. The, you know, mm -hmm. those moments that are taken for granted in screenwriting. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Well, I think that, that those were, I mean, in some ways, one of the reasons they're necessary is that these are, these are people who lived before the word transgender was known. I mean, they, it was a word they had certainly never heard. So they don't have, a vocabulary for discussing the place that they're in, never mind the emotional difficulty of it. There aren't the words. Um, and so I think that was why those beats really, really needed to be present. And so there are scenes like, I mean, for example, this, this scene where, where Einar is looking in the mirror at the theater and looking at, at the body that he has and kind of willing it to become Lily's body. 
uh, which is a it's a kind of companion piece to the work that Gerd has been doing when she paints, where she paints him, and in a sense, she is also she sees that wish in Einar. I think she sees Lily, and she's already starting to paint Lily in Einar. Um, but I think when we see him in the theatre and he's looking at himself, it's an unusual. I mean, it's not an unusual thing to, in a film to have to have a person who's questioning look in a mirror. But I think this is a very different look in the mirror. This is a person who is willing a different body into into being, a different self into being, um, and it's a kind of transformative scene. And it's I, I think of it as a sort of companion piece because it's in a very beautiful theatre, it's in that theatre where we've seen all those tutus hanging and it's all very kind of gilded and and it feels warm and feminine and, and kind of safe and that's why Einar goes there, it's what attracts him. But then there's a scene later in the film where, where, he, where Einar goes to a peep show um, and we see a very different kind of mirroring where, where and, and again, it's a scene that without any dialogue um, but where where Einar Lily is still presenting as Einar um, is, is mirroring this this female striptease artist and 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 she looks at the face behind the glass and and realizes that this is the gaze of somebody who is not objectifying her. This isn't someone who's watching her as an object. This is someone who is. Who was who, who was trying to who was really identifying with her? Who was wanting to become her? Who was kind of feeling their way under the skin of those movements? Um, and I think those two scenes are, are, you know, for me, really kind of critical in that respect. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, the other great thing about the movie, and you talked about this earlier, but I just want to touch on it again, <laughs> is the fact that Gerda has such a big role in it. I think it's really yeah. surprising that. She undergoes as much of a transformation as as he does in a lot of ways, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think the thing, probably the thing that hooked me when I first came across the story, that I think the thing that I found most intellectually intriguing and and in a sense kind of filmic was the was the the fact that that she that she sees Lily with her with a painter's eye it's with an artist's eye that she sees lily and it's through those paintings that lily is manifested out in the world as opposed to locked inside einar and and those paintings enable lily to to manifest in reality to incarnate um and obviously there is a cost in a sense to gerda in that respect in that she loses einar who she loves um, and she, and she, there is a sort of period of mourning, even though she's gaining something different. I mean, it's the concomitant with any transformation is is a loss. Um, but I, I found that just such an intriguing and and cinematically sort of marvelous prospect that there was someone who was that Lily was being, in a sense, conjured. She was being conjured out of Einar by Gerda's paintings, by Gerda's process, and that even when Gerda doesn't want to see Lily even when she's starting to be frightened about where where this 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 new development is taking their relationship she's an artist and she doesn't look away she's she's got such kind of authenticity herself and such sort of creative courage that she can't look away and she continues to paint Lily and Lily continues to actualize um so i i think that's right that that's she's an extraordinary character and, a, and an unusual it's an unusual women woman's role, I think, in some respects in a film. You know, she's very front-footed. She's not seeking your approval, and uh, and she's full of unexpected decisions. Um, I think lots, of, quite often in the film, there aren't people don't say what you're expecting them to say. They don't go the direction you're expecting them to go, and and I think that's. I mean, I hope that's refreshing for people. But uh, but Gerda certainly, she's a force to be reckoned with. Um, and yet she is also capable of this incredible selflessness. And somehow those two things are are connected. And that's, there's something kind of, there's some lesson to be learned, I think, for for all of us in that. I certainly, I look at that and I think, what an amazing thing. Because one tends to think, oh, I, if that in order to be strong in the world, you have to be selfish. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 she's, she's the opposite of that. She's incredibly powerful in the world uh, and she's selfless. Uh, so I, I have, that's, that's a real conundrum. Right. And, you know, lastly, um, you could have never known 
writing this movie 10 years ago, that it would come out at a time when transgender issues are really at the forefront yeah. of society. Yeah. And I mean, there are several films coming out about transgender issues, television shows, you know. Um, so can you talk a bit about that and what a movie like The Danish Girl can do to help in people's perceptions of transgender yeah. issues and, and helping push those forward? Well, you're right. It's an absolutely, it's, it's just bizarre. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in Washington, DC. Uh, mm -hmm. If you could see out of the window, the White House is right behind me. Um, <laughs> I'm here because we, because we were in the White House yesterday with this film. We were asked to screen it here. Um, I think um, President Obama is the first uh, president ever to use the word transgender. Um, and has been a great supporter of, of, of the LGBT community. And we were here as part of a, a Champions of Change event. So when I started on this project, it came to me, the book jacket says it's, it's a story about the world's first sex change. And uh, that's, that's language that we, really, we wouldn't use anymore. When we were filming, when we were making the film, it was about gender reassignment surgery. It's now about gender confirmation surgery, the language is moving very, very quickly um, to reflect thinking uh, uh, on the topic. I think it's become a transgender film in a way that I wouldn't have expected. And I, I never thought of it really as a transgender film in, in that sense. I think of it as a, as a, as a story of, as the story of a, a partnership, an incredible human partnership um, that is in some respects really out there and in some ways very old fashioned because it's so much about loyalty and commitment and about people trying to stay together. Uh, so I, I, it's, we couldn't have known that it would just be part of this rising tide of acceptance um, around transgender issues, and I couldn't be happier. I hope the fact that, it's, that it is also a really beautiful period love story, I hope that means that it will penetrate uh, into communities that m perhaps still find these issues challenging or just they, 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 they feel they don't kind of really understand them or they it's not something they're particularly interested in you know I really hope that this is a film that will that will reach out and have a kind of much broader uh, appeal to people um, and and of course I, I hope that it's, it's part of a you know a continuing journey towards acceptance for this community that, that does face a great deal of discrimination misunderstanding and violence you know, if we can be part of that, then how amazing, how amazing. Of course, yeah. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations on the film. Really, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Zach. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.